of course there are people who say that oh are we are we being dumb right now we are we so afraid of speaking up and all that it's not an issue of afraid of speaking up speaking up is easy but how to manage a very delicate situation that is a challenge Wong Xiaoning and this is The Breakfast Grill. The Ministry of Transport's objectives are to ensure people and goods are moved safely, efficiently and sustainability to improve quality of life and support a competitive economy. But it is that achieved, be it in the sky, on the seas and on land? Questions we pose to the Minister, Anthony Look, who is also the Secretary General of DAP, which of course means that some political questions will be added to the mix as state elections are around the corner. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Anthony. Now, this year alone, more than 112 million rides were taken on our urban trains and buses in KL, Penang and Kuantan which implies that significant numbers rely on public transport. But yet we know that it is a service that needs improvement. We see complaints of trains frequently breaking down, infrequent bus and train services, overcrowded platforms, and I could just continue. Yep. Yeah, so yesterday in Parliament, kudos to you, you said that commuters will be able to enjoy shorter travel time with more train frequencies. But really, can we also expect improvement for all the services I mentioned? Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, there are a lot of questions about public transportation. We know there are a lot of challenges. And in fact, when I went back to the Ministry of Transport, when I became uh, the Minister of Transport for the second time, my first act was to uh, spot check uh, an LRT. Yes, but people so, managed to spot you even yes, though you wore uh, your mask. Well, that, that shows my priority that uh, we want to focus and uh, give a lot of attention to uh, the issues of public transportation. I know that the frequent breakdowns of LRT and uh, MRT services mm. um, is a big problem. It's a big, big issue. There are uh, hundreds of thousands of commuters depending on public transport every day in Klang Valley. And uh, the numbers actually are improving, yes. uh, increasing. Uh, I just got the updates yesterday. Uh, as of now, actually, uh, daily we are talking about seven to 800,000 commuters using our various uh, platforms. Mm. Uh, MRT1 is uh, increasing. We have reached about 210,000 ridership daily. Uh, Klana Jaya Line, LRT, Karana Jaya Line is of course the most congested. Uh, these are the uh, very, very uh, uh, highly demanded uh, services. We know uh, these issues uh, must be addressed. Yes. And one of the things that uh, I focused on was uh, to push Prasarana to give more attention on uh, uh, maintenance and uh, a lot of focus are being uh, put on maintenance and we have introduced a new KPI, mm. MKBF, uh, mean kilometer uh, between failures to track on uh, how good uh, we are or how bad we are. Okay. So right now, of course, that, that focus is, uh, is on, on the top mm. and I, I want to make it public. That's why I asked Prasarana, you have to uh, publish the data every week. Mm. Okay. In terms of ridership, in terms of uh, some of the issues you have to be uh, every week, they have to update their website every week. And in terms of their performance of MKBF is uh, every month. Okay, but uh, Anthony, we do know that Prasanna Rana, I think, is going to receive 2.8 billion, right, from the government and also, well, be it Ministry of Finance and Transport to replace all these aging equipment. And you've mentioned these KPIs to yeah. ensure that there are no breakdowns. But are we just putting on a band aid when really surgery is needed? I mean, do we need to do more to to ensure that there are no serious accidents, that there will be no breakdowns? The reason why I ask this is some of it is driven by this, you know, would you say a lack of maintenance culture or do we just not have the funds in the first place? Well, I think the funds, uh, of course, funds is important. Funds is a big challenge. But mm. uh, uh, Minister of Finance has actually uh, approved in terms of funding uh, for Prasarana in terms of uh, the uh, credit facilities are prepared for Prasarana. So the focus must be on uh, the good maintenance culture. That is something that I have uh, uh, emphasized on them. Okay. And they're doing that right now. So hopefully right now by the third quarter, because there are new trains uh, adding into the Klana Jaya line, that will help in terms of uh, easing some of the congestions and to uh, increase the frequency. Uh, that is being done right now. And for other lines, we have to also uh, focus on maintenance. Uh, I mean, you, you can't guarantee there's no fa no failure at for all. For sure, for yeah, sure. That's for sure. But how to minimize it? 
mm. how to how to prevent it. Mm. So in the past, it's more reactive. So you have an issue, you have to address that issue. But what we are putting in right now is a very strict regime that you have to be preventive. So what are the components that you have to uh, repair? What are the components or the spare parts that you have to replace? That must be according to the schedule. So I think I the issues. I had assume all this was done though. They are, they are such a regime, but I think most of the time probably is not follow okay. in terms of uh, some of the funding uh, uh, priorities are not. I mean, are, are diverted into other areas and all that. And also, you have to uh, look at Prasarana. Uh, uh, in the past few years, uh, probably there are a lot of disruption in terms of uh, the leadership in Prasarana. Yes, uh, management. Okay. I think uh, the changes of. The management team is too frequent, mm. uh, and so there are some leadership issues and all that. I mean, I do not want to go back to the past, but you know what happened, <laughs> uh, who led it at the time, and all that. Uh, what happened during that period? Yes. So, so I think we have to put more uh, focus on good governance in mm. the organization, which is we are doing it right now. I, so I'm happy with the current uh, management. Board, the, Current board and the management, of course, are people that I know I work with, because uh, the current CEO is the former CEO of SPAD. Mm. So uh, Azaruddin is someone that I've worked with uh, before. So it is more uh, easier for me uh, to 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 communicate and to understand each other, okay. and to make it very clear to them what the priority is. But in the first place, is is this a model that doesn't really work? In the sense that you know we have current levels of ridership trains at around the seventeen. A million a month, six million for buses, but it's really just not enough to cover operating expenditure, which then leaves very little for maintenance and eventual upgrades. So, what's the longer term solution? Because it doesn't mean that the government is just continuously going to have fu- to fund the public transport system. And I, I've seen reports that Prasarana has debts of up to thirteen billion ringgit. Well, first of all, I think public transportation. Uh, we're never able to recoup in terms yes. of the investment. You have to understand that. It's a, and it's government a has social required. Yes, yeah. government has to has to invest into it, and uh, there are uh, yearly allocations for public transportation, uh, in many other forms, not just in for prasarana, but in any, many other forms. But I think moving forward, we also have focus have to focus on some of the revenue uh, model of mm. prasarana. Which of course, if we if we have a good uh, team and a good governance in in in, in the organisation, we can tap into the transit oriented development model TOD. Of course, there are lands, there are stations, which can be further developed to generate revenue. So the non fair uh, revenue model, that is important, equally important. But all this in the past have been uh, uh, sort of been uh, I wouldn't to use the word misuse, but uh, taken uh, opportunities by people who are related uh, or have political interests. So that's why it's very important that Prasarana cannot be led by any politician. So that is something that that we are very strict on. And I, Governance I, is key. Yes, the governance, because uh, this uh, uh, is related to a lot of development as well. Because when you have station, when you have land available, then there is an opportunity for development. And the so land side becomes want to mix that. very valuable when there's a train stop, right? Yes. So mm-hmm. so we want to we want to make it uh, sure that uh, whatever whatever asset we have, whatever land we have, it must be maximized in terms of value. Okay, and I'm sure there is a KPI to raise ridership because pre pandemic it was about 1.2 million people every day, and, and like you said, the numbers are still below that. But with the lack of seamless travel and poor last mile connectivity, that will be a challenge, won't it? Because to enlarge a particular catchment area, every station needs efficient ground connectivity and supporting systems. So, uh, And realistically, we don't have this in KL. So what are the solutions? Well, I mean, part of the uh, solution or, or part of the program when we build MRT and all that, uh, you have a bus system as well. Yes. So uh, together with the project, uh, locations are being made to purchase buses. Uh, but uh, uh, probably uh, the buses are not well run. I heard forty uh, percent are not working. Uh, as I mentioned in Parliament, yes, uh, only only about half of the buses, the current fleet, are in operations. That is something that that we have to admit. Mm. Uh, and uh, of course, that is something that uh, one of my next focus will be on uh, pushing Prasarana to improve the bus services. And I also told uh, Prasarana that we also have to look at uh, not just as a single operator. We have to work with other operators as well. If you can't run everything yourself, then you have to you have to uh, 
uh, work with other parties, work with other operators. So some of the routes, maybe we can uh, outsource. Uh, outsource it to other operators. Bring back the mini buses, some people say. Yes, <laughs> we are prepared. And in fact, I have uh, spoken to uh, different 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 uh, parties, in, including elected representative. Uh, some of the PJ representative just met me last week. Uh, they they proposed to me uh, a system of mini buses in the area. I said, well and good, but I said you have you cannot just depends everything on the government to provide those uh, services. So why not we bring back some of the private operators? Okay. So if you can have private operators to run some of the services, some of the routes, then we 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 don't have to reinvent the wheel. So we do not have to compete with each other. So government is supposedly to complement. So we do not want to be. Uh, seen as killing the industry, mm. and uh, uh, we are we welcome private operators to to take part as well. Okay. So for public transportation, of course, uh, issues is that public transportation is not easy to recoup in terms of the investment. So yes. there are not many operators are willing to put that kind of money uh, into the services. So, but uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we never know. There are probably some very uh, creative business model that they can work on. Uh, uh, we, we try to facilitate okay. and we welcome any pr- pr- private operators to come forward. All right. So this will be something to watch out for. But let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. And this is where I'm most puzzled because is there a clash of interest and policy? I say that because we want Malaysians to use more public transport. It's better for the environment. Helps us achieve our carbon uh, goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. But yet we still encourage car ownership with petrol subsidies, the national car policy. And then we like to build elevated highways even when residents don't want it, like the PJD link. So what's the priority of this government? The priority, of course, we have to balance it. Uh, we, we can't, say, we can't uh, uh, commit to say that uh, right now, immediately we cut down the, mm. uh, the usage of private vehicles. I think that is a societal uh, policy. That first of all, you have to prepare the, the, the infrastructure uh, everything we do, we must be uh, in progression. You cannot uh, come up with suddenly a policy. You want to replace everything with another options, which of course uh, is not easy. To manage the change is not easy. We have to we have to be very practical about it, uh, and we have to be realistic about it. So managing that change uh, takes uh, a lot of courage and a lot of time. Okay. So for the time being, of course, we try to we try to balance it. We have to uh, ensure that continuous improvement into public transportation to prove that public transportation is dependable in Klang Valley. And slowly, of course, we are also changing some of the other policies, which of course will, 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 be, will be done, uh, uh, will be implemented accordingly. So like petrol or you're, or you're talking about well, the I highways? I don't want to preempt which one anything is it? right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, of course, there are a lot of discussions ongoing. Uh, we do not, we have no decision has been made yet. A lot of discussion moving forward. But of course, there must be uh, uh, priorities and also focus into some of the mega trends as well. So if you talk about low carbonization, I mean, uh, uh, how to how to uh, how do we uh, improve our uh, adoption of EVs, for example, yes. uh, public transport. So public transport, of course, we hope that uh, more uh, EV buses on the road. But that again is a cost factor. Uh, and the infrastructure factor. So the, these are these are things that we have to coordinate with various ministries. It cannot be done by just with one ministry, and uh, it must be done accordingly with other ministries as well. Uh, so that our policies must be in tandem. So, but but it I'm, doesn't seem like it's t- in tandem sometimes, right? Uh, w- most of the time, and was in one? silos. <laughs> yeah. So is that going to change? Are we still always going to build highways when there's congestion? Are we going to tell people, fine, drive your cars, you know, let, you know we'll continue to subsidize it? Mm, I think, of course, that narrative has to change uh, somewhere. But uh, uh, but as I mentioned, we have to manage that change uh, mm. very, very uh, cautiously. It is not easy. I mean, immediately, for example, if you say that you want to change that policy, that people will say, what is the alternative? Yes. Okay? We have to provide that alternative. And we have to have that in place before we talk about uh, asking people to change. For sure, we, the alternative would be convenient, cheap, and reliable public transport, right? Yeah, I'm fully aware of that. Yeah, I'm fully aware of that. I mean, that's why we say that, first of all, whether it's cheap or not, it's cheap. That's why we have imp- uh, implemented the policies of a monthly pass. Yes. With 50 ringgit, you can travel in any mode of public transportation. 
uh, isn't that cheap? Yes, I mean, it's, it's very, very affordable. Very affordable. It's a very good initiative. So in terms of in terms of affordability, it's very affordable. Yeah. But convenience, uh, of Question course, mark? there are issues there. There are challenges there. So we know, and and the culture of taking public transport. So I am actually very confident that if we make it right, uh, we can, especially in Kang Valley, in, in, in big cities, taking public transport should be a norm. Second nature. Yeah, in, 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 in major cities. So it's not an issue that uh, Malaysians do not take public transport. So I, I don't believe into that. I don't buy that uh, assumption. Now, YB, let's look at the aviation sector that also comes under MOT. Now, it was reported yesterday that one of the two aerotrain services at KLIA will start operating next year. Great. <laughs> but in the first place, why and how was critical airport infrastructure allowed to deteriorate to this extent? Well, the aerotrain has come to the end of life uh, cycle. It's 25 years since the opening of KLIA. And the replacement was supposed to be done much earlier. Yes. But I uh, suppose that the decision was made uh, quite late uh, by the uh, board of MHB. Of course, there are various issues. Uh, they went through a lot of uh, a process of tendering that project. Uh, so eventually, it was uh, a bit delayed. And of course, during that uh, COVID period, it was delayed as well. Actually, so, wouldn't the COVID period be an excellent time to actually do all these repairs because um, the airport wasn't really I utilized. can only say that when during the COVID period, I'm not, I was not a minister. Yes, of course. So I cannot be accountable for that. So, but, but of course, I mean, there's no point going back to what has uh, uh, happened. What happened yet. So what we are doing is that to look forward. Uh, of course, the, award, the project has been awarded. Mm. So what I've done is that uh, I've called all the parties involved. I give them uh, some pressure apply uh, right directly so. to them uh, to say that you have to get out your acts together. Every party should be the main contractor, the subcontractor, the system operator and all that, the KYA, uh, KYA uh, uh, management, MHB. Everyone has to facilitate that to make sure that the project must be uh, 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 happen faster. So that uh, instead of 2025, supposedly their schedule is that the first train can only, only be operational by 2025. So I said, it's too long. I cannot wait two years. Mm. People are complaining uh, like every a, other day. It's such a bad impression for a visitor. Yes, it is. Uh, but to be fair, uh, of course, uh, a lot of mitigation has been put in place in mm. terms of uh, more buses has been applied uh, to between the two buildings, between the satellite and main terminal building. Uh, so the efficiency of the bus services are quite high. Uh, but still, uh, people, of course, are unhappy because uh, they have to walk quite yeah. a bit, uh, quite quite a long uh, a, a bit of journey. I mean, depending on which uh, which particular gate they are uh, assigned to uh, for their aircraft. So uh, the aero train definitely is a major uh, issue for us in the airport right now. And that is our major uh, okay. attention. Uh, the project is uh, is done and overseen by MHB, mm. but of course, MOT is uh, fully aware of the progress. Okay. And I have uh, met them uh, just about two weeks ago. So I have given them very, very strict deadlines. I said the first train must be operational by July next year. But would we be in this position if Malaysian airports was not enjoying a near monopolistic position? Or is this because the current operating agreement, which gives it limited avenue to recover capex for spending, it's actually due for renewal and has well, not I been signed. The aero train, uh, 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 I mean, it should not be an issue for the aero train. They should train have just progressed. The, uh, aero is something that is uh, a key component and is a key infrastructure okay. uh, in KYA. And then uh, uh, I do not think that the operating agreement uh, limits the expenditure on the aero train or all the other key infrastructures in uh, uh, KYA. So it doesn't deter MHAB, which is this new KPI, I think, that MOT and MHB1, which is to be a top 10 Skytrack airport. If the OA isn't signed this new operating agreement, can, can that be can that happen? First of though? all, the OA is, has, been, has been negotiated. There are some uh, technical issues which we are trying to uh, trash out. Okay. Uh, it is at the, I mean, it's at the AG Chambers right now. We have to just finalise it. And I'm pushing it to be signed as soon as possible. So that there is a clear, uh, clear issues. I mean, some of the issues must be cleared, and there must be a clear framework moving forward. 
and uh, we hope that it will make it more uh, dynamic for MHB moving forward mm. in terms of uh, spending capex. Yeah. Uh, and 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 making sure that improvements are made into our infrastructures. All right. Uh, I, I, you know, there have also been these press reports that MAHB may merge with Malaysian Aviation Group. I think you saw that. Uh, you know, it's I, I, I do not know where the, that news that, come from. Okay. That is a totally different uh, two very very uh, different. This one is operator. The other one is airline. So it's two different focus. So you no, be, no. I I do not see that happening. What about MAG with capital A, of course, better known as Air Asia, because that's a PN seventeen well, that, that, company. that has been that have been talked about for many years. Yes, but uh, I don't think that there is any any headway on that, mm. because number one, I do not think that uh, uh, they are not the same model. One is a premium airline, the other one is a budget airline. So I don't think that is going anywhere. Okay, and what do you say to those who view them? But anyway, I mean, just to just to be clear, that is beyond us. If it ever happened, it's a commercial decision, but I'm not the aware. The ministry is not going to get involved. The government no, is not no, getting involved. I mean, as far as MOT is concerned, I'm, we are not involved because MAG is under Air Kazana. Yes. So it's not, they don't uh, report directly to us. I mean, except as operational issues, they have to, uh, they are, of course, uh, regulated by CAM and, and, and MEFCOM. But beyond that, we are not involved in the uh, commercial and, part of and it. And you don't think it's a synergistic merger? Well, I think I think first of all, uh, they, are, they are running on different models. Okay. So I do not see the synergy there. And uh, what do you say to those who view the Ministry of Transport as being more protective of the airlines than passengers? You know, because social media, you, you occasionally f- see it flooded with complaints of poor passengers who have had their flights delayed, the poor customer service stuck with vouchers, and of course, customers stuck with vouchers that are hard to redeem when they are cancelled flights rather than getting cash refunds. Uh, there, it's always, must, there must be a balance in terms of how do we govern. Uh, we have to look at uh, the challenges and also the the uh, uh, the complaints from both both sides. Yes. Know? Of course, we want to protect the passengers. They are a code of uh, protection. Uh, code of passengers uh, under MAFCOM that they have certain rights uh, to claim from the airlines to, to complain like the, about the airlines. Yeah, but it, the process seems very cumbersome and then sometimes when you complain that nobody replies you, it's like talking to a void of emptiness. To be honest with you, I, 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 my office uh, play that part play that role as well. Mm. We are something like a complete bureau. <laughs> so a lot of emails, a lot of uh, social media messages come to my office as well. So yeah. we do uh, process it. We do send to the relevant authorities and the relevant airlines to get it done. So occasionally when I uh, saw some issues on the social media, I, I do uh, pick up the calls and uh, call the airlines to, to say, please look at that. Yeah. So, but I can't do that every day. Of course, of course yes. there must be certain There must be a process policies. and procedure yes. in place, Understood. right? Understood. So that's why these are the things that we have to improve uh, under MEFCOM. This is definitely uh, the code of uh, uh, conduct for airlines and pes- uh, what are the protection for passengers. That is under uh, MEFCOM. Of course, there is a framework that they will be improved on. But uh, I'm not to say that I'm protecting the airlines, but you have to also appreciate that the challenges faced by the airlines. Mm. There are only a couple of airlines. So if you want to, you want to kill any of those airlines, uh, then uh, you will be less, one less competition. Uh, for us is that we are not killing any, er, anybody. What we want to do is that to ensure that everyone can uh, uh, operate in a fair, in a competitive uh, environment. And we hope that... Uh, uh, they can provide good services to 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 the passengers. So airlines do face a lot of challenges, especially after the pandemic. Okay, very quickly, one one last question. Uh, in in thirty seconds, will you be reversing the carbon touch policy, which is still in place? Because we want to focus on data centers and all things related to AI and digitalization. Well, well, yeah, when you talk about carbon touch policy, it's a very big policy. Yeah. So it's depending on which but sector. But for the undersea submarine undersea cables, undersea submarine cable, I'm fully aware. In fact, I've met uh, some of the representative from some of the. Uh, uh, Technology companies, so we have uh, we are in a very good discussion. We are on the same page. So Currently, operationally, they do not face any issue. Okay. But moving forward, they want to have clarity. They want to have a better policy, which we are doing, which we are trying to solve their issues, uh, once and for all. Uh, of course, we know what they want. They want more clarity, and yes. they want. How certainty. soon will you give them that clarity? 
Well, I we are in a process. In fact, we try to have a workshop together. Okay. To 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 look at all the issues, uh, not just on one aspect, but how to make sure that. Uh, uh, give them give them a good environment. Give them mm. a clear uh, a policy to move forward. Anthony, let's talk about politics because the unity government is more than six months old. How has it been to to work with all foes, AMNO in particular, and B coalition partners running this country? Has it been a challenge? Well, of course, it is a challenge. Uh, it's a new experiment. Um, but we, we, we understood uh, the situation post-election that every parties must work together to form the unity government because uh, we have a situation where there was a hung parliament. Yes. Uh, and uh, you just have to put aside your differences and to, 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 to get uh, this coalition government uh, up and running. Uh, but working with uh, past enemies is not something that uh, we do not have experience. We have worked with past foes before in 2018. So we have served under Mahadi, <laughs> Jun Mahadi. I personally, I was uh, in his cabinet. So I I think that working with different coalitions and diff, uh, working with diff, uh, people with different backgrounds and different ideologies, it's not something that we don't have experience. So, But is uh, it a challenge though? Of course it is a challenge to, ex- mm. to manage expectations, to manage uh, each other's uh, 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 in terms of their views and all that. But by and large, in the cabinet, we have been working well together. Uh, I think the Prime Minister has been very accommodating. I think he has been moderating well uh, in terms of the various uh, views and expectations and to come to a conclusion and to come to uh, a decision. So uh, as far as the cabinet is concerned, I can very confidently say that it's functioning well. Okay. So you seem to have received the memo well that everybody needs to get along, but... I'm not so sure Amno did because if we look at the assembly recently, the Amno assembly, uh, there still are calls for DAP to apologise, in particular by the Amno youth chief. So, does this, you know, how how then can DAP and Amno work together when you, it seems that there are unresolved issues and palpable differences in values? Well, you have to accept the fact that uh, in politics they will never be able to resolve all issues. So you cannot you cannot move forward to say that uh, because there are one or two outstanding issues, then you don't work together. Okay. Because we have decided, and you know that the situation of having this unity government uh, was was made in a very very short period of time, it was just in a matter of days mm. to form a government <laughs> post election. So of course there are unresolved issues. There are uh, issues uh, within the grassroots, and you have to you have to appreciate the fact that Amno is a is a big party. 3 million members uh, and yeah, well, kind of, in terms of their uh, background, they were in power for so many years. So there are a lot of different voices within AMNO. But what is important is that the leadership, mm. okay, the president of AMNO and the leadership, uh, they are representative in cabinet. So I think the understanding at that level is very important. So I think we have those understanding. Uh, of course, there are different voices, which I think I have uh, make my point that we have to move on. Of course, we respect each other's views. Uh, there are views of across the divide, uh, across, uh, you know, across both parties as well. Uh, but we cannot be listening to everyone. Okay. So there must be certain and direction. Having, and not having to say sorry, at, you know, all the time, which is what they well, want. I think I have made my point very clear. Yes. <laughs> Uh, that 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 if if there are no ends to it, if we uh, if we just continue to buck on the same issues, okay. So uh, I, I so that we want to uh, we want to go past that. Yeah. What is important is to move how to move this government forward, and how to make the government functions well. Mm. That is my priority. Will you all then be working together at the upcoming state elections? I mean, it's it's going to be unusual. I mean, running on a common manifesto, sharing the same campaign trail, canvassing for votes together. Is this possible? Because state elections are very soon. Are there plans already? Yes, there are plans. I think uh, when we form the unity government, one of the understanding, one of the key understanding is that we do not fight each other. And I told my colleagues uh, in PH that if you look at the history and why uh, BN and Prikatan National uh, coalition uh, did not uh, work well or they ex- exploded uh, very, very, very quickly, very, very soon. It's because when they formed government in Putrajaya after uh, the Sheraton move, 
uh, within a year, they fought, I mean, within months, mm. they fought each other in Sabah, mm. in the Sabah state election, then followed by Johor and followed by Malacca, or Malacca and Johor. So if you work together, then you contest against each other in the state, at the state level. That does not work. That okay. would not work. That is a, a, a recipe for disaster. For, for disaster, for the breakup of the entire coalition. So we are very well aware that if you want to make this government works and to at least stay the course, then you have to work together politically. Okay, but are you then going to have to make way for any of the coalition partners and not contest in certain seats, uh, which may be even won by your members already? No, I think when we went in, uh, when we started the, seat I know that we, right? when we started the discussion, there are certain parameters which, uh, which is a starting point. Mm. What is the starting point? The starting point is that we have to respect incumbency. Okay. So seats that we have won, each other have won, then you have to respect that. Of course, in, in, in the negotiation process, there are demands, uh, even on incumbent seats, that we, we are open for negotiations. We do not say that we cannot negotiate at all. But of course, there are negotiations, but we must start off with parameters. The parameters is that they, we have a principle. The, the, the principle of incumbency is important in okay. any negotiation. So that must be respected. But along the process, we can negotiate. There are some swapping of seats and, and so on. That, that is normal in negotiation. So what is the invisible line then that DAP will not cross when it comes to this <laughs> unity government? I mean, at what point does the party say, we cannot and won't do this even if it risks up breaking up this already fragile coalition? I think, I think we, we are very well aware. Our, our 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 bottom line our you know what our, is the bottom line so, but i think i do not want to use i mean uh, put that uh, openly mm. because i mean the moment you have i mean every coalition and every party in the government uh, start to say oh i cannot accept this i cannot accept that uh, that is a very very negative kind of thinking so rather of looking at the differences we want to look at what are our common grounds Okay. So let's focus on the common grounds because the moment you talk about, oh, this is my bottom line, this is my uh, 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 line that you cannot cross. Every party has a line to, uh, that you cannot cross. But, but it that sounds line also like, keeps you in check, you see, as a party and holds you to what is We are very well aware. I, will, I mean, we are, I mean, among the leadership, uh, uh, we have our internal mechanism. We are very well aware of our party position mm. that that certain things that you, ha you, you I mean you cannot compromise. So, let's so say that is like something dropping that of corruption charges, releasing of certain these are things that we communicate with the prime minister. Mm. Uh, I mean, I communicate with the prime minister very frequently. I told him what our views are, but some of the things that we we manage it uh, differently, because bearing in mind that together today we are managing a government with nineteen parties. So you have to have to give rooms to the prime minister. So he has to uh, manage and to 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 balance between few coalitions and nineteen parties. So if we are a senior and a very close partner to the prime minister, so if we do not give him that room and that understanding and to uh, support him, he will face a lot of difficulties. Mm. So. I think, of course, there are people who say that, oh, are we are we being dumb right now? We Are we so afraid of speaking up and all that? It's not an issue of afraid of speaking up. Speaking up is easy. But how to manage a very delicate situation, that is a challenge. Yeah. And we have to be understanding about the challenge faced by the Prime Minister. Okay, so related to this, of course, I have seen reports that DAP grassroots members are not always happy, right? I mean, they've been keeping the faith, working against the odds and delivering the seats at each general election. So this time around, 40 seats in GE15, but yet only four DAP ministers in cabinet. Now, PKR, 31 seats, but eight ministers, and even UMNO has 26 seats with five ministers. Do you think it's it's a bitter pill to swallow for the grassroots when they observe these numbers? Well, I think I have addressed that issue, that, that question, on the very first day after I got uh, uh, sworn in. Mm. Immediately, I was sworn in in the, in, the, in the palace. Immediately, I held a press conference to answer that questions. Do you still get... To put you know, myself uh, in the line mm. to say that I take full responsibility. But I decided to accept this formula and to respect the decision of the prime minister, knowing well uh, the political situation then and the limitations. 
And this is the decision that we have to make. And you have to accept that the fact that uh, appointment of ministers is the priority of the prime minister mm. or, or, uh, or the uh, jurisdiction of the prime minister. Uh, as I said, we leave it to the public. Uh, we leave it to history, to judge us. Uh, what is important is that whatever portfolios, whatever responsibility that we are taking, we must do it well to show that the DAP, what is important is we are contributing to nation building. We are not just after position. Yes, position is important for us to do works, to contribute. But what is important is that the responsibility that we are taking and to, to chart the course of the country. Okay. That is, I think, our contribution to Malaysian politics. And staying on this nation building, right? When we voted, I think we can see it's increasingly more polarised, not just along racial, but increasingly along religious lines. Does this worry you as a, a leader of what many forget is actually a multiracial party? Of course, it worries me. And that's why we make certain decisions the way we made. I mean, if we do not, we do not uh, uh, put our mind into it, if we are not concerned about those issues... I mean, I can just make a lot of noise. Mm. As you said just now, why are we given only four ministerial portfolios? Yes. So it's because at the back of that situation, at the back of our mind, we know that there are issues. There are polarization in the society and the polarization is real. Yes. And it is a danger for the very multiracial fabric of our country. And that is the reason why we take certain steps back, you know, to, to, to ensure that that this government can function. And you like it or not, uh, Anwar Ibrahim is the best prime minister that you can have today. Mm. There is no other option for a better multiracial uh, coalition so for the country. So you think that's still the best strategy for, in a way, national reconciliation? We because hope that you still have some leaders that say that only Malay Muslims should lead and rule and you know and, and, that's, and that's the, the rhetoric that's the is not comforting yes of course I mean if you if today this government does not work if this government fails what is the option the option is that you have a coalition which do not believe in multiculturalism who talks about just one single race and religion in this country so that is not an option for us as far as DAP is concerned as far as I'm concerned that is not an option for us so we have to make this government works because this government upholds uh, 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 multiracial and multi-religious uh, fabric of, the so of this society and of our country. And the Prime Minister is committed to it. So I think that is the very reason why we, we make decisions, uh, the decisions that we made. On that note, thank you for your time. Today on The Breakfast Grill was the Minister of Transport and also DAP Secretary General Anthony Lok. I'm Wong Shaoning, BFM 89.9. Thank you so much. 9.